right. I guess hello and welcome everyone. I am Alexander Oltner. I am the game director for Crusader Kings 3 and I am here today with one of my dear colleagues. Hey, I'm Veronica. I'm a game designer on CK3 as well and medieval historian, but you know, I'm a third one. <laughs> <laughs> and? Hi, um, I'm Dr. Eleanor Yanaga and I am a medieval historian and Crusader Kings enthusiast. So we are here today to talk about anything and everything surrounding CK3 tours and tournaments. And there's more than just tours and tournaments in there. There's everything from pilgrimages to whatever else, really, feasts, mm. hunts. So uh, the list of topics for today is essentially endless. But where do we <laughs> want to start? Mm, I think the, the, the place to start is actually tournaments. And I think the, the reason to start with tournaments is when people imagine the Middle Ages, I think tournaments are pretty much where their mind goes to immediately, right? It really um, is. There's, and I mean, there's a reason for this. I mean, first of all, uh, it's something that a lot of us have experience with. You know, like when you go to, you know, quote unquote, Renaissance fairs and stuff like that, there's always a tournament. Uh, but also this is something that always comes up in movies about the medieval period, all sorts of things, um, you know, kind of like reinforce this thing about the tournament. So it's no wonder that this is something that people really respond to, I think. Yeah, I think what people really think about this jousting specifically, they, they think about, you know, a nice tale we were talking about before uh, recording, just mm. about how does like the idea that people have of the Middle Ages. Exactly, that a, a tournament is nothing but a joust. Yeah, it's just jousting. Horseback yeah. jousting and maybe yeah. someone hid a, a little pointy tip in their lance and, you know, mm. that's mm. far from all it is. Yeah, it's also what we do in the trailer, actually. Like in the trailer with a bit of joust. It's an evocative image. Yeah, well. <laughs> Well, I mean, yeah. jousting is really cool, so I completely understand how we got to this point, mm. but I find it it's so interesting that, like, you know, actually for a great majority of the medieval period, if you were talking about a tournament, you're actually talking about melee, aren't mm. you? Like, it's it takes a really long time for it to evolve to a place where what you're doing is jousting and you're, you're getting kind of, like, involved more specifically with horses or with, you know, all of these specific acts of dexterity. That they do right and for a long time you know a tournament is kind of like they put up a you know a sign on a door and it's like a tournament here and then everyone comes and just like beats the hell out of each other for you know a few days and it's and i think that's actually so cool and nobody ever talks about it it's exactly what our research showed when we started yeah. doing this that you know the the chivalric tournament that everyone thinks of is quite a late invention we represent mm -hmm. this in the game as well by not unlocking Joust something yeah. later. But the melee, yeah. as you say, was just people arriving and then beating yeah. the hell out of each yeah, other. Yeah, it was just <laughs> two gigantic armies just cra clashing into each other, being like, oh, I captured you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, just like it's really just kind of like a, a giant kind of like royal rumble with also like a kidnapping aspects, mm. you know, or like a people kind of coming in disguise and doing things. And I think that uh, actually, if you kind of said that to modern audiences, we'd kind of be like, oh, that's actually cool as hell. Like it's, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm not trying to shade jousting. Jousting is very, very cool. And I like it very much. But uh, if someone was like, hey, you want to come like watch a giant melee? I'd be like, yeah. <laughs> this is, More than that's anything. That's incredibly cool. Yeah. yeah. Like, please invite me to this, you know? And it's, it's also interesting, too, because it's kind of sets like a lower barrier for involvement, right? Like, um, these are the skills that you would use in a melee, for example. Those are going to be ones that are more available to kind of like literally any knight. Right. You know, um, when you're talking about kind of jousting and things like that, that's really high echelons because you've got to have the really nice horse. You've got to have the time to train. You've got to have all the equipment and things like that. Whereas the great majority of knights are just kind of like, you know, a guy with a sword who's legally allowed to have that, you know, and they train for sure. But it's like it's not the same kind of level of outlay that is involved for tournaments. Right. I will start jousting tournaments, I should say. Exactly. Yeah, I, I think it makes sense because like Malaise is kind of like a mock battle and that's what they used to train as well from what we read. So, exactly. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's yeah. mostly a thing to prepare for war, yeah. right? At least 
in in theory, mm -hmm. while yeah. while later era jousts are so full of rules and regulations, like yeah. that's not very practical for actual warfare. It's more yeah. for showing off how rich you are, and how yeah. cool you are. Mm -hmm. Like in the Carolingian Empire, uh, I read there was like an example of an early tournament that wasn't called tournament. It was called a military game. It was in Go Worms, I think it was, and they just called mm -hmm. it that. They were like, oh, they were military games, and you read about it. It's like, oh no, they were practicing for battle. Like that was the main purpose of the early tournament. Yeah. 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 And I mean, it, it, it really does kind of like come out of that, right? So it, it mm -hmm. starts out as this as a practical thing. Like, here's a practical way of making sure that you're you're ready at any moment to, to kind of go to battle if it comes to that. And then it just kind of slowly evolves more and more specifically into a sport. Right. And, and more particularly from that, a spectator sport. I think that's also one of the things that kind of comes out of it is that I think the melees, as cool as they are, as much as I would like to watch them, and people certainly do go to watch them, it's not as great for spectators, right? Because it's sort of like, how do you get a view? You know, th these are really big things that kind of like uh, can take up whole fields. And it's like, well, how can you really have a, a, a way of, of looking at that? Whereas for jousts and things like that, they can build stands. It can be a little bit easier to kind of like get crowds more specifically in for it. So if what we're thinking about is tournaments as a commercial venture, it really makes sense that they involve they evolve in this particular way. Um, although it disadvantages, you know, more lower well lower class isn't the right word, is it? Uh, poorer knights, you know, you can't be a lower class of knights, just poorer, right? Yeah, especially seeing as the early melees, if I'm not mistaken, had a tendency of spilling out outside of the arena and like yeah. entering the crowds and then you don't really know where the crowd starts or the the melee starts so which is so typical for medieval sports generally like i mean that's also medieval football right where it's like eh, it's a stylized brawl and also there's a ball somewhere right? <laughs> you know? but, and uh, everyone joins uh, in <laughs> so the same as yeah, now <laughs> Yeah, and you can completely much. understand too why you know cities and things like that are not going to be quite as interested in hosting tournaments when you know it's a melee like that because it's like oh great like how much property damage are we looking at for that yeah. whereas if you if, if you scale it up to jousting you know exactly what's going to happen you need a specific field for that and you can just be like oh yeah well i don't know put it up at smithfield and we'll handle it from there you know like it's it's just a little bit easier to deal with than the melee but does that make it cooler i would argue no I don't know, maybe I'm very biased because I really love a night's tale, but I love jousting. I just, because mm -hmm. it's like the thing that you think about when you think of the Middle Ages, right? You see two knights jousting, maybe the token of favor of a lady and stuff like that. Was that real? Like, did they give out like tokens? Yeah, I mean, they so? certainly do. But weirdly, the mm -hmm. thing about it is a lot of that is actually more like, I mean, where do we draw the line, right? Like what's mm. medieval and what's early modern? But a lot of it is more early modern, right? Like mm. that really stylized thing of getting a lady's favor and then, you know, like picking up the glove with your <laughs> with your lance and, you know, like the, the mm. difficult feats uh, like that. We are kind of like talking more like ugh, 16th century mm. a lot of the time and a lot less like you know, 13th century, 14th century, which is, you know, late anyway. But these are the things and the rituals that kind of evolve once we get to that level um, of jousting kind of taking over. Because, uh, you know, then when you're like, okay, definitely everybody here is pretty noble and pretty high up the food chain. It's like, you can then be like, oh, no, we are being fancy. <laughs> you know, It's like, you don't have to worry about kind of like getting brained in the side of the head with a mace anymore. And now you can, you know, worry about flirting with girls, right? Which is a fantastic way of doing things. Things. Um, but of course, we think of that more often too because, well, it's closer to us, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, it, it's closer to us in time. We know that this is something that happens and it really does go on for a long time because it's such an incredibly popular sport, you know? Um, so people like jousting because uh, jousting is cool. Like that, that's just a, a fact of the matter, right? But um, is it what a tournament is in the medieval period? Is you know, 14th century, certainly, mm -hmm. uh, but it's it's also not like as um, highfalutin as we tend to think about it now, I think. Yeah, like, for example, we see in the 12th century uh, examples of jousting being banned from tournaments because they thought it was a distraction from the uh, melee. Uh, yeah, so there's a yeah. very, very long history of uh, mm. people at tournaments getting in yeah. trouble for being at tournaments, right? Uh, mm. So this kind of like starts um, with uh, some papal condemnations, like way, way back. Uh, so Innocent II is the first mm. one who kind of gets in on this, which is helpful because mm -hmm. it shows us, um, you know, when 
tournaments start becoming really popular, right? Because it's like by the time a pope is like, no, I don't care for all this. You know, we know we know that it's that, that it's quite. Popular, then you know right? you've so, made it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like by the time the pope is condemning you, you're you're doing well. So. Um, Innocent the second, um, he says, like, okay, well, we we need to condemn tournaments because the deal with it is you're risking your life for nothing. Right. And really, if you ask them, if you're going to go around risking your life, if you're like some noble guy uh, who can fight well, why aren't you going to the Holy Land? What's stopping you risking your life going to the Holy Land on crusade? <laughs> right. Which is basically like the Pope's <laughs> like constant thing from the high medieval period on was like please 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 go to jerusalem right so they say okay if you die in a tournament right if you then get killed by your wounds in a tournament which also makes a lot of sense if we're considering mm -hmm. that tournaments are like the melee a lot of the time right they're like okay well we will let you do confession uh but we won't let you have like christian burial Right. So Ooh. it's like That's you're going to get, crazy. you're going to get, yeah. Because then yeah, you go like to uh, really. Purgatory, right? Yeah, exactly. So oh it's like God. straight to Purgatory yeah. for you. Yeah. Because you're essentially, you're gambling with your life, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then this like gets reiterated over and over again, like throughout kind of the 12th century. So like um, in 1139, they reiterate this. Um, Eugene the Third reiterates this in 1148. Um, you get like Alexander the Third does it. Um, Innocent the Third, like the most lawyerly pope of all, is like, oh yeah, absolutely, we're doing it. Basically, all of the innocents were like, yeah, no, <laughs> you can't, you can't get onto this. Um, and then like Nicholas the Third, all the way in the 13th century, in 1279, he is like, yeah, I am going. I will also get kings in trouble if you're allowing mm -hmm. tournaments to happen and you don't kind of like if you don't call them off. I will like come for the king and you will get in trouble, right? Like I will, uh, I will attempt to excommunicate you if you aren't cracking down on this. So it's like pretty intense stuff if you are, you know, a God fearing Christian, which most of these people are, right? So like, uh, and when you've seen, you, but you can also understand why, because you have these examples, like, uh, for example, um, Robert of Clermont, who was the younger brother of the King of France, um, got a really bad blow to the head uh, once, and basically he becomes, like, impaired after that. So it's like he's basically in, insensible, is what they say about him after that. Uh, so, you know, there are these examples where, like, the creme de la creme here are, are, like, actually getting getting injured. And, you know, this is how a King of France dies at some point in time. So... It is like, it is a sport, like it absolutely is a sport and it's something that we can all understand. But just like sports now, people get injured, you know, people have terrible things happen to them as a result of it. And it is kind of important to sort of consider that as well, right? Absolutely. I think that's something that we had trouble with in the game because uh, every participant just kept dying. <laughs> like, it was unstoppable for a while. Like, uh, you could send all your nice to tournament, no one could come back. It was, it was like, a little bit excessive yeah. at a point there, yes. Yeah, we had trouble balancing because it was, it was like, okay, they're obviously gonna, it's like, someone's gonna die, okay? Like, you're just having two armies clashing and just, you know, throwing blows left and right. Someone's gonna die. But it was mm. it was difficult to balance. Okay, how many are gonna die? <laughs> mm -hmm, yeah, because mm -hmm. you, you have to have some, right? Yeah. Like some people have to get injured, some people have to die. But uh, you know, it's it's really difficult to say. The you the thing is, we know all about like these high profile cases. Like I can mm -hmm. rattle off the people who have died, and you know there probably are a bunch of people who are lower down the tree who died and we just don't know so much about them because like, eh. Mm. But fundamentally what it comes down to is if you're, if you're the church is like, I would like mm. you to please go on. <laughs> it's just, it's always about crusade. Uh, you know, like I think in the end, like the, one of the last things we see about it, um, it like Clement the fifth writes about it and he's like, these tournaments are fatal to the crusade. Mm. Right. Because no one wants to go prove themselves in the Holy land anymore. They just, you know, go prove around to tournaments, which, arena. which are fun and sexy. Right. Tournaments are fun and sexy, whereas like going to the Holy Land is incredibly neither fun nor sexy. So, mm, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's what I was gonna say um, before when we were talking about uh, favors from ladies. Mm. That I mean, mm. maybe the formalized process of gaining a favor was something that came later. But honestly, showing off in sports, you know, yeah. that's uh, mm -hmm. that's a, yeah. a thing as old as time itself. You're like, oh, the Knight of the Swan, that way. Yeah, that like, way. look at me, oh, I won the yeah. melee. <laughs> And then you die from your wounds because yeah. you can't afford a doctor, but hey. 
Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> you know, it's, but it, it's a hundred percent a big part of it. It's like you know, just getting in front of in, getting in front of the ladies. You know, it's like such a big thing. And that's one of the things that I really like um, from kind of like the later medieval period too. Like I like all of the crazy outfits they have on, where they're like, oh, I have a little statue of Venus on top of my helmet, and you know, my symbol is the heart. And it's like, ladies ladies yeah. the whole time and i'm like i absolutely love that stuff i live for the pageantry you know it's great something that absolutely we great realized or some people realized when they were doing research is that themes for your team was a thing that happened like you would dress yeah. up the same and that some people came dressed as like the pope and his cardinals yeah that was crazy we also found oh, i love that yeah, we also found when in 1331, I think it was, that they were dressed as starters and they were just, you know, scaring the ladies or trying to. And like, <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, I love that. You also get a lot of um, cross dressing that happens at tournaments. And like, this oh. is like a really fun and sexy thing that happens uh, oh. where like women will come dressed up as men and it's like, ooh, because, you know, like, <laughs> so they're showing their legs off, right? Because they're all wearing a hose and stuff. <gasps> so um, it's like, a like the cross dressing as aspect is like very risque and incredibly sexy. Uh, so I, I dig that for them. It's great how they find all of these ways to kind of like turn it into flirting. Absolutely brilliant. <laughs> Yeah, I guess like uh, another example that comes to mind is the whole thing with the round tables, where they were mm -hmm. basically LARPing to be like Arthurian nice. They were like, oh yeah, I'm totally King Arthur, I'm Lancelot. I'm this is all for showing off. They just want Obviously. to be seen, of yeah. course. Yeah. I love yeah, this. And it, yeah, and it's so funny because you like, like you've absolutely hit the nail on the head. Like it is LARPing a lot of it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just kind of like basically yeah. like, oh, we're going to take these things and, and, and do them. And here's my favorite story. Like, oh, I'm Lancelot, you know, and mm. you, you get these things that happen. And um, I, I really like that because it just kind of shows you how, you know, no, there's nothing new under the sun. Like these people write fanfic, they LARP. <laughs> they, they, you know, are just looking yeah. for an excuse to flirt with girls and like this is and this is the way they do it. It's brilliant. I had another anecdote based on the Pope's and the Pope's uh, reluctance for tournaments in the game. So we haven't explicitly blocked Popes from hosting tournaments, <laughs> although most of them will not want to do it because they are Popes yeah. and their traits will not line up. On the other hand, when they host a tournament, they host what I like to call nerd tournaments. I've seen the Pope host nothing but board games and poetry recital. <laughs> Yeah. So is, oh my god. Yeah. It is so appropriate. That's exactly what I expect yeah. the Pope to but do. But it was real funny because for a while the Pope was the person hosting tournaments. <laughs> so you would hover over Europe and it's like, oh, there's a tournament going. What is that? And it was like, oh, it's the Pope with his recitals or whatever. <laughs> I yeah. love that. It, it, it actually, that's this is an interesting thing is that there are all these different forms of tournaments mm -hmm. as well, right? Like you get chess tournaments, you get poetry tournaments. A big thing for like the middle classes is crossbow tournaments what? because they are not allowed to participate, right, in like jousting or whatever. But they have like these big, especially in like the lowlands, like um, you know, around uh, what is now Belgium, there are like all these crossbow guilds that members of cities participate in, and then they'll have a big crossbow tournament and people will come from all over Europe to show off their crossbow skills. So it's like there's a kind of trickle down system of a tournament where, you know, people will be like, oh, the sport I'm allowed to participate in is crossbow archery. So here we go. We're having that now as a tournament. And uh, it's it is fun to kind of like see the nerd tournament versus like the middle class tournament versus, you know, <laughs> yeah. like the, the, the fanciest uh, royal tournament that you do for, I don't know, like your wedding like if you're a king, especially in the later medieval period, that wedding tournament, that's a big one, right? That's, that's when you know you're having a really good time. Yeah, I was thinking about uh, the big one that uh, Louis VII, I think it was, hosted when his son got a uh, coronation. And he was huge, apparently it was like 3,000 knights or something like that. It was absolutely insane. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's like, it becomes such a thing, especially later on, where it's like you need that tournament on top of whatever it is you're doing to just kind yeah. of prove well, a few things. Like, I mean, it's conspicuous consumption on the one mm -hmm. hand. It's like, yeah, look how big we're going. I've got, I'm having a 14 day tournament, you know, like we'll have these tournaments that go forever and ever. And I'm inviting everyone in. And, you know, that allows you to kind of show off your hospitality. It mm -hmm. allows you to show off your own horsemanship skills. Um, and it kind of also brings more attention to whatever it is that you're doing because a royal wedding isn't necessarily going to be that interesting say you know you're 
you're English and you're living in the backwater of, of London in the way that I do, right? And everyone's like, who cares? You know, like, who cares what the King of England is doing, right? So this isn't like the King of France getting married or something boring. But the minute you're like, yeah, there's a 14 day tournament, everyone's like, oh, yeah, I, might, I, could, I could go to London. I could go, you know, like, and so the, it, it is a kind of like incentive to bring people in, right? Yes. They want to go and see the ceremony. Of course they do. Yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> and there was also like we we found that uh, they could have like great banquets to accompany the like the tournaments, like the patron of the day could host uh, like a feast, and then then they could give out like uh, prizes and stuff for the nights. So that was also mm. very cool because then we got a lot of uh, cool art that you know we were like, oh yeah, make me an amazing sword or whatever. Yeah, I like it too when they come up with like different orders for Mm. tournaments and they're like oh yeah we're the order of the you know whatever you know like because you have the real orders like the golden fleece Mm. i don't know as saint george things like that but you know they'll be like we're the order of the olive branch or whatever and then it's like you know your your participation trophy and stuff i I really take that (laughs) something we did in the game is that for certain knights especially the ones that uh, do well in tournaments they can gain an accolade and they are named exactly that sort of stuff. It's like, oh, you're yeah. the knight of the olive branch. Yeah. I absolutely and- love that because, um, well, they loved it, didn't they? You know, you, being able to have like the, some kind of like sporty name that you could do. Uh, I absolutely love it. And I also like it because it really reminds me of like wrestling now. Like, you know, it's it, this it's very kind of like WWE style kind of, uh, you know, these huge rumbles, you know, you get all of these nicknames. Everyone kind of like remembers the lore of the last tournaments. And I think that is just absolutely brilliant. Right. I mean, I, I love it. It's it's another point towards the whole it evolved over times from martial games into just spectacles. It's the same with mm. modern wrestling. I suppose yeah. started as a sport. Now it's just for show. But I ask, like, because we also see, like, examples of people, you know, as you said, like the villagers were very happy when a tournament was hosted there. But, like, were kings very happy? Because we see, like, kind of both, right? We see some kings banning it, some kings really getting into it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, and it really depends. So it's like my, uh, you know, my favorite dynasty, the Luxembourgs. Shout out Aww. to Emperor Charles IV, oh right? There, there's this the whole thing where um, his father, John of Luxembourg or John of Bohemia, depending who you ask, Czechs are like, of Luxembourg. Screw that guy, right? <laughs> um, the Czechs absolutely hated him because he was really into tournaments. Mm-hmm. And all he did was kind of like go around Europe and go to different tournaments and joust. And he basically just just treated Bohemia like a bank account and was like, yeah, yeah, I need some more money for a tournament next. And he never, ever, ever like came back to Prague. Uh, So uh, they would call him like a king foreigner or John the foreigner or John the absent all the time because he was just always going around doing all of these ridiculous things. And they were like, this is not benefiting us at all whatsoever. So it's a really interesting kind of, um, double-edged sword where if you go to the occasional tournament and you win everyone's gonna be like oh that's amazing or if you host tournaments at home and everyone gets to go that's amazing but if all you do is do it elsewhere right and then pay for it out of the kingdom's bank account then everyone's gonna hate you right so there's this really fine line there i was thinking about when henry the second became uh King of England, he was like, no, no, no tournaments. Like, we're not doing that. Because it was very, uh, un- like, it helped make the realm more unstable because y- you mm. had all these knights together in one place. And that could lead, you know, to plots or could lead to rebellion. It was, like, very dangerous and scary. Also, knights weren't very nice. Like, they could go and, you know, there were rumors of them stealing, rumors of them starting tavern brawls, rumors of them just, you know, just having fun. Mm, yeah. mm. Because when you're, I I think, a knight and you're at that kind of level of society, you know, whether or not there is a law, question mark, right? You know, it it really kind of depends because, you know, people are kind of like, well, what am I really going to go do about this guy who's brawling? What can I really do to stop this individual? And unless it's really kind of impacting on whoever the local nobleman is or the constabulary are, they're going to be like, yeah, well, rich people, what are you going to do? You know, and, you know, even if you kind of call them on it too, 
it kind of brings into question, well, who called the tournament? Because like, so are you saying the king shouldn't have called a tournament and brought this guy here, right? So there are all these really complex levels of legal responsibility and shame that are kind of involved in it. So for average people, they tend to like the party, but it's just everything else is is a bit of a problem, right? Well, more than once, I think, entire villages were burnt down by rampaging knights. We had mm. we have an event like that in the game and it could it would only trigger. It would trigger constantly. So every time you hosted the tournament the village could burn down. It was like Yeah, yeah. we of, of course we've fixed this since yeah, yeah, all of this but it, like almost every <laughs> tournament it would burn down the village constantly. Yeah. yeah we had a lot of fun backs with tournaments because it, they were so deadly. Like we were like because we read obviously in uh, research we were like we were like oh they were deadly. And we're like okay turn the sh up. I was like, it's the most deadly thing you can ever do. <laughs> Deadlier than war, usually. Yeah, yeah. No, wow. Yeah. It, yeah, yeah, early in development, it, it was not uncommon for half the participants to die and for yeah. the county to be burned down to zero development. Yeah, now we've fixed this, but it's taken, it's taken a lot of balancing. Unfortunately, yeah. I love that, and I kind of think that it's quite funny <laughs> to just like always like, well, you can have a tournament, but we're going to burn everything down. Yeah. Like, that's, that's kind of fantastic. <laughs> In that case, I recommend start a tournament, spend nothing on accommodations, and then see what happens. Oh, yeah. okay, right. It's like invite watch everyone, me spend like, nothing on it. Yeah, I'm I'm seeing a new way to really screw myself over in my next <laughs> campaign. <laughs> you, you can bankrupt the uh, like the kingdom real quick with tournaments. They're so expensive. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Yeah, I'm such um, a sucker for these things, though. It's like all of my friends always make fun of me whenever I'm playing Crusader Kings because I'm always like just trying to hold court. And like, and now it's like, and now I'm just gonna be trying to have tournaments because it's like, I'm like, yeah, 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 wars, but I'm holding court. You know, da, 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 yeah, wars. I'm having a tournament. It's gonna be, I'm never gonna get anything done, but I'm gonna have a really nice time. So the that's fine. The yeah. Pope could have hated you, like in real life. He would be like, oh, yeah. what are you doing here, girl? Like hosting tournaments, you're not crusading. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you can I can do both. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Well, I think that's also like one of the big kind of things for medieval people, right? Is that actually they do like stuff, you know, I think that we tend to focus a lot of time on wars and conquest and things like that. And they are thinking about, you know, tournaments or going on holiday slash pilgrimage. Mm -hmm. whatever you know like they they are like traveling for fun and doing things like that around the shop and that kind of gets lost a lot of the times because of the way that we think about history or the way that we teach history right what a fantastic segue when you said yeah. traveling He's pilgrimages a and tourism He's a pro. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Because that's, that's right, a yeah. massive part of... I mean, we can go back to tournaments later on, but you also have to travel to tournaments, and travel in, in, in and of itself was yeah. a, quite a big deal, at least back then. Mm. I mean, going yeah, from... The tenor and course, like the whole thing. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting one because uh, people kind of tend to think, oh, well, you, you know, you're born in a little village and then you die there, which is true. Right. Like, I'm not saying that, that that it isn't true on the whole, but frankly, people travel a lot more than everybody really realizes. Like, even if you're just some peasant, you go to town all the mm -hmm. time. Right. Like you're, you're going to have wool that needs to go to town or you're going to have like particular goods that need to go in at particular points. So you're going to do that. And really also like every single medieval pe person wants to go on crusade. Well, not sorry, not crusade. I'll do that again. Um, and more particularly, every medieval person also at some point in time wants to go on pilgrimage in their lifetime. And that's re that's really expected, you know, um, and, you know, whether that is just going to be kind of like a local pilgrimage to wherever your closest holy site is, that that is completely possible. Or you might go on one of the big ones. Like, obviously, Jerusalem is number one. The, the, like, the ranking is Jerusalem, mm -hmm. Rome, San Diego de Compostela, right? That's like one, two, three. That's sort of like the, 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 the hot top three. Um, and then if you can't do that, well, there's going to be something closer by you. And it's also something that we see, uh, you know, monarchs or particular churches and things like that try to attract. So, you know, when people get a saint at their like monastery or whatever, they're like, yes, yeah. You know, and then like the minute they die, they're like, oh, look, the whole body's on display. Like everybody come on down, like come on down and like get your relic. 
come see the miraculous body or um <laughs> we see um again my boy uh charles the fourth does this in prague in the mid 14th century where he wants to make prague a religious destination mm -hmm. so he goes around europe kind of like a uh, strong arming relics out of other rulers like he goes and visits other monarchs and is like i hear you have some really nice relics and they're like oh would you you want to see the relics charles and he's like ah oh, that'd be great if i could see a relic and then they're like charles could i give you the relic as a gift and, oh wow that's amazing oh oh wow that would be incredible you know and then he takes them back to Prague, and he's got just like hundreds of relics and he sets up a specific feast day called uh the feast of the holy lance and nail that he gets papal dispensation for where if you come to Prague and you see all the relics then you get a certain amount of um of uh, indulgences on top of it and, it, and it's it's quite a lot. It's like a three years or something. So he turns Prague into a specific pilgrimage destination, like really successfully, uh, where people are like, "Oh yeah, I better get down there and like see all of these kind of relics." So yeah, like maybe if you live in the German lands or something, it's not going to be possible for you to go to Rome or to go to Spain or like certainly not Jerusalem in the 14th century. It's just all a bit too dicey. But you can go to Prague. Right. And that means, you know, money for the city. It means money for everyone along the roads. It is a real form of tourism. It's just tourism that's centered on a religious thing at the end. That's all. Yeah, I would say that it's a lot like what you said of creating pilgrimage sites, because, for example, when El Cid died, uh, they got the monks at the monastery of San Pedro de Cardenia, they convinced his wife, they were like, oh, the king, uh, the seed just died. What if instead of having him here, here at the cathedral, you know, Valencia, you bring it to your monastery where the real cool people are? And they mm -hmm. wrote a whole, like they commissioned a whole chronicle that was called the Chronicle of San Pedro de Cardenia, telling all the story about, you know, El Cid was this cool guy and he, you know, killed people after he died. And all that legend comes from there because they wanted to attract people to see El Cid and to give them money mostly. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because it's just like cash exchanges hands, yeah. right? Like that, this is one of the big ones. Like um, there's a very famous uh, French saint, Saint-Foy. Mm -hmm. And like one of her miracles, one of her uh, posthumous miracles is like people went to go see her reliquary or something and didn't leave her enough money. So she like tore a guy's eyeball out after he leaves and is like walking down the road and everyone is like very holy. Yes. Uh, fantastic. And it's like this entire <laughs> miracle. That's all about how like you got to give <laughs> like, yeah. like don't go don't go see in saint foie if you're not going to like leave a bunch of yeah. money. And it's like cool. Sounds very holy. I guess. <laughs> my, yeah, I love oh it. Oh my god, that's a slight wing. But yeah, my favorite thing about pilgrimages is like the whole badges, like the whole oh, like, yeah. you know, souvenir, like kind of commerce that started there, like because it's crazy. Like you see them everywhere, you see like the weirdest stuff. Like uh, mm. we found saying a lot, and I mean a lot of traveling vulvas that they were called. That's just yeah. what it is. Uh, what, <laughs> Yeah, because it's, and that's one of the fun things about pilgrimage, right? Because like yeah. pilgrimage on the one hand, it's this very holy thing that you do, right? Um, and on the other hand, it's like spring break, woo! You know, it's so like all these people <laughs> yep. are like, well, when you're on pilgrimage, it's like, well, you're under plenary indulgence, right? So it's like you can absolutely get down and have a bunch of sex. So you get all of these great <laughs> pilgrimage badges, you know, with the vulvas or the yes. penises. Or um, one of my favorites is uh, two people having sex under a penis tree. <laughs> Absolutely oh incredible. Um, there's a woman who's like uh, pulling penises out of the ground like they're carrots. That's a great one. You know, you have all these kind of things where it's like, yeah, yeah, everybody, I'm up for it. Right. Like the, the international sign that you're up for it is the, this kind of like a pilgrimage badge, we think. Like, to be clear, sometimes yeah. people are like, maybe it's a fertility thing. And I'm always like, I feel like you're you're going too far. Like, the, the obvious thing <laughs> that these are is, like, kind of funny and, like, showing that you have a sexual sense of, you know, it's the same thing as um, when you see, like, bachelorette or hens parties now and they're all mm. walking around with giant penises, right? It's, like, the same thing, but for pilgrimage? And uh, I think that's great, right? I mean, uh, absolutely think that uh, we should bring them back also. It's like many more like vulva badges, please. That'd be great. Yeah, I feel like uh, every time no one knows what the thing is, they're like, oh, it's a fertility symbol or it's a ritual symbol. Exactly. It's like, oh, it's just for rituals. Um, yeah, it's, every time when you, you get like something that's obviously like, a, you know, a, like a phallus or something hmm. and people are like, uh, maybe it's for a ritual. It's like, that's a sex toy. I'm sorry. Like what you were going so far out of your way. <laughs> To just like it's like no medieval people medieval people would do that 
I assure you, they, that is what people they were doing. Would they do were that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, exactly. Medieval like, people like, are yeah. people. I remember a Favlio, yeah, exactly. <laughs> a, a very famous Favlio that was about a convent of, na of nuns, and they found uh, good on Fallus, and the whole Favlio is about how they change, like the Fallus changed hands because all the nuns want to get, get it. And it's like, yeah, medieval <laughs> people had a sense of humor, and they were very, yeah. very, very dirty. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> We've tried to represent a lot of what we're talking about here in the game as well. Yeah, you can get badges, I you think. Can, There's uh, an event for that. You can, uh, you can go on either pious or worldly pilgrimages, and your intent can vary depending mm -hmm. on who you are. You can either, you know, just reflect or be a zealot or just revel along the way. Yeah. Whatever you like. I have to say, I'm very excited for all of this expansion, but it is going to completely distract me. Like, this is all I'm going to be doing is like trying to get all the badges. Like, that's it. It's terrible. I know. Like, I can yeah. see myself doing nothing. Like, everyone's going to hate me. Everyone's going to have a really low opinion of my kingdom, and I'm going to be like, look at my penis badge. You know? <laughs> we we added uh, a super, well, not super cool, but uh, to me, it's a super cool event because it's one of my favorite pilgrimage uh, things, which is the Goddess Calistinus. That was a greeting in Santiago Compostela, 12th century. And it was like, you know, it was five books. And the first books were like, oh, this is, you know, liturgy. And these are miracles. And these are, you know, the body of St. James. Mm -hmm. And then the last book is, oh, this is a pilgrim's guide. And it was like a tourist guide telling you, oh, you should visit all these shrines along the way. Or you should stop here because they have made the best fit. Or beware because there is this scam going on. And we added uh, an event for that that's called the Pilgrim's Guide or something like that. Uh, to me, it was very cool because it's like, oh, it seems anachronistic, but in reality, it's no, not. Yep. Yeah. It's really it cool, really actually. Kind of, yeah. yeah, I think it's really cool how, you know, there, there is this real kind of market, so to speak, for kind of like travel guides and information and stuff like this. And the way that people look about, uh, look at it or the way that people think about their lives, it's you know, this tourism, this kind of, you know, pilgrimage, this is going to be a factor in their lives. And it's something that they're going to do. And now you can choose to relate to it one way or another. You can do it. You, I mean, you can do it for the food. You can do it for, you know, seeing the relics. You can do it for holy reasons. There's all sorts of reasons that people do it. But it is just this super common fact of medieval life. And I, I think that's neat. You know, I think that people don't really realize how much people move around um, and how exciting that is for everyone. And also how tourism has always been a thing. Yeah. In a way that mm -hmm. we can relate to. Like, mm -hmm. obviously, if you're going somewhere, you want to know where you're going. You want to follow familiar roads. You want to know what to see. Get the best food. Exactly. <laughs> Many reasons to do tourism. Yeah, it's like, yeah. Uh, you know, there, it's, it's interesting always seeing the things that they go on on for tourism. Because it's like, oh, yeah, there's absolutely pilgrimage is probably like number one. But also like bathing. That's a big one. They love to go. They love to go to a famous hot springs. They're they're like they absolutely love to go have like a posh bath somewhere. That's very fun for them. Which I think I'm like we also do that, right? Like we go to spas and things. Or so did, I've heard. Did they also like do the whole beach episode where they go to the beach with their family? Yeah, like I mean, pe people do go to the beach and people do mm -hmm. swim a lot. Like we have lots of. Um, uh, illustrations of people doing this like kind of mm -hmm. splashing around and things tends to be a little bit more dominated by men but on the other hand that might just be what people are drawing right um whereas um at the hot springs and stuff like that it is just like naked free for all it's like everyone's just going for it and uh you know it's it's just a bathhouse like any other bathhouse so you know you do kind of like have this um you do have a pretty cavalier a uh, spirit of nudity at the time you know because they're they're like a oh, privacy what's that Anyway, like, let's go all go have a bath, you know? So you, you do have, like, these really kind of fun things. But, yeah, people go to the sea. That's something that they enjoy doing. Um, especially if uh, people are from landlocked places, they love to go see the sea and be like, wow. You know, it's uh, <laughs> just like now. I must take a bath. I'm not sure if we have events for that, but maybe we should add some. Uh, maybe. Mm. Just a whole beach episode of Van Chang. I mean, if you're from a place without yeah. a coastline, maybe going to a coast, yeah. maybe, I have to take a bath in whatever sea this is. Oh yeah, fun. that'd be really fun, yeah. Yeah. When you go on a pilgrimage, you have to leave your realm, like, unless the holy site is literally within your realm, but most often that is not the case, especially Jerusalem or mm. somewhere really, really far away. So then you have to leave a regent in your stead. That was super common, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. didn't always end well. 
No, I mean, I, I re- okay, so this is, I realize that this is just turning into Eleanor talks about the Luxembourg's uh, hour, but like, sorry about it. The Luxembourg's Please are cool do. as hell. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so one of the things that happens, right? Like, this is not a virtuous pilgrimage, right? This is, again, I'm talking about uh, John of Luxembourg and how he's always gone jousting, right? And that's all he does is, um, and um, everybody hates him and his wife is regent. So um, his wife, Elzbeth Pschemislid, is like back in Prague, kind of like trying to get all the work around here done. Um, and everyone hates him so much that she eventually kind of like hatches a coup against him where like she gets starts talking to all like the czech nobility and they're like we got to get rid of this guy and she's like please my trash husband he's so awful and like she hates him and they all hate him because he's never there and he doesn't bother to learn czech and all he is is like off jousting so they they come up with this plot where they're gonna like oust him and they're gonna make like baby charles the fourth king and then she'll be regent at the same time as well until he achieves majority or whatever and it almost works except he finds out about it like it comes back to prague for the first time in like four years uh, like manages to kind of like squash the rebellion down and like kidnaps charles and sends him to live at the french court and so like the whole thing gets like shut down but it shows you that these things really are a gamble right like especially if you don't get on with your wife or you don't have really good relationships with the various people in your realms doing this does come at a cost you know it's one thing to be like yeah haha plebs you don't like it that i'm at tournaments you don't like it that i'm away all the time what are you going to do and well the answer is some people do live here Right. Like some of the nobles do and they they will come for you. Right. So you have really got to trust your court if you're doing something, uh, you know, especially like, uh, say, for example, um, going on pilgrimage or going on crusade. Like, let us not forget, you know, we've got this English example of Richard the Lionheart, who I think everybody over eggs. You know, thumbs down. And like, luckily, Eleanor of Aquitaine was left to kind of like take care of the realm, like the only member of that family who had a lick of sense. Right. So everything kind of like goes just fine. But, you know, things do kind of weaken while he's away. And, th- and this is a very real thing that people have to kind of like keep in mind. And it's one of the reasons why they don't go to Jerusalem. You know, it's why you would be maybe go to something or the Compostela instead. Like, well, it's not quite as long. It's not going to be years off my life or whatever. Because if you do one of the really big pilgrimages, like you go to Jerusalem, in a way that kind of becomes the story of your life. And maybe that's a good thing, because sometimes people are like, I love this. You know, my king went to Jerusalem. This is incredible. What a holy guy. Definitely everybody like two thumbs up, right? Which is kind of what Richard Lionheart is dining out on, right? Like that's everyone is like, oh, he went on crusade. Isn't that nice of him? Where it's like, I don't know. He was mostly sieging castles in France, but like whatever. That's not the story people tell. (laughs) But, uh, you know, you might you might get a really great reputation for going on a pilgrimage like this but you have to have that trust at home you've absolutely got to have a good region in place and you know your wife better like you at the very least or you better have like really good uh kind of administrators who are surrounding you who will take care of this if the thing that you want to do is dedicate your life to kind of like religious travel which you know to be fair some people do right it's also very interesting because uh, going on crusade was seen as a pilgrimage as well. They were like, oh yeah, you're going to the Holy Land, that counts. Like, that's the matter mm-hmm. what you're doing there, that counts as a pilgrimage. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like, you know, that is kind of like a the pilgrimage because like yeah. not only are you going on a pilgrimage, but you're putting your life on the line to do it, mm. right? So it's kind of like, oh, that's this, the best way that you could ever do this. And that's why the church gets so confused slash angry about, about why people aren't doing it, where they're like, why are you risking your life in tournaments when you could do the ultimate good? And it's like, well... You know, if you're going on crusade with one of like the big armies, it's sexy because there's going to be lots of like uh, camp followers who are like coming along after you. So it's like there's going to be lots of sex workers and stuff who are kind of like bringing up the rear. And, you know, you can have and you can have a sexy good time. That's fine. But by the time it's later and you're just kind of like on pilgrimage, it's, eh, you know, it's a little less. It's maybe sexy on your way through Europe. By the time you get to the Middle East, you don't really know what's going on. You're going to have to have native guides. And if you're doing something like before they're abolished, for example, relying on the Knights Templar, they're not going to hook you up, right? They're not going to be like, oh, yeah, the brothel's over there, guys. You're going to have to sit there and be like, oh, yeah, I was really excited about praying you know so it's like it takes away all the kind of like plausible deniability of like the sexiness of uh, of pilgrimage right now that we're talking about uh, super big cool pilgrimages i was thinking about mansa musa and his amazing hash but the numbers that we see there like my question is how real are that because you know medieval people were like oh yeah number is symbolic you know number means big army 
Because in, uh, yeah, in this I, case, they're saying, oh, yeah, he, he went with like 60,000 Saudi or something. It's like, was he? Yeah, I mean, Mansa Musa, right? It's like yeah. just, so a lot of question marks about that because here's a dude, right? Like, mm -hmm. uh, what can I say but dudes rock whenever I see Mansa Musa? I just, I love to see it. You know, he's on probably like the Hajj to end all Hajjes. Now, could it be exaggerated? Yeah. But even if you've exaggerated like three times as much, this is still an incredibly impressive Hajj, right? Um, and, you know, signs point to, yeah, like that's what he did. You know, he was just like, this is this is like a, a treasure pilgrimage. And, you know, this is something that you see pretty frequently um, from courts, not necessarily European ones, uh, but certainly within North Africa or China is really big on this as well. Various like Chinese regimes, you know, they're very into kind of doing the largesse thing. So um, it does a couple of things when you go on a Hajj like this, right? So in the first place, you're doing Hajj. Fantastic. Great job. Like 10 out of 10 Musliming. We love it. <laughs> but also the thing that you're doing is you are bringing esteem and acclaim to your kingdom, right? So you're showing we have the money to do this for me to be like, oh, yeah, hi, I, that's Mansa Musa. Here's like a bunch of gold, right? It, it shows that you're a really impressive kingdom and it, it raises your esteem with everybody around you. Um, but it also can be a form of piety and a form of um, kind of a, you know, charity for other people as well. So it's got a lot of layers of meaning in there. Now, having said this all, like Mansa Musa is like the best to ever do it, right? Like there's a reason we talk about him. Probably other rulers are doing something similar, but just not at the same level. And, and it makes sense because they, they simply do not have access to the same amount of gold that Mansa Musa does, because they just don't, right? Like, they just don't have the gold mines, and like, we just we just know this for a fact, right? And that, that's the reason why, you know, uh, Timbuktu and places like this are so important, right? Uh, but it is something that everyone is going to kind of strive to do or wish to do to a greater or lesser extent. Um, and so similarly, you know, with China and the treasure fleets. <laughs> Um, that they kind of have going around. So yeah, th that's not pilgrimage for them. But they are like, uh, gonna send a boat somewhere, give people silk. Yeah, that'll be good. You know, like it's it's yeah. just like a fun thing that medieval monarchs do, and and that's kind of nice, right? I mean, I find it, the entire thing incredibly interesting. We were about to add a Mansa Musa esque pilgrimage type, actually, <sighs> decided against it because it's incredibly niche. Yeah, happened once mm -hmm. in history. And incredibly expensive. Like, you could break your game. Yeah. Immediately. I mean, he did create hyperinflation where he went. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. It's like, okay, like, gold I mean, is now worthless. What do we do? Our yeah. economy has crashed. <laughs> yeah, it was impossible <laughs> to model in the game. Like, it was yeah. just uh, uh, nonsense. See, this is the thing, too, that's quite interesting about it. And one of the reasons why we know it's probably true is these stories about inflation. Mm. Right. It's, it's like because th that's like the unsexy downside of this. Right. Where if it didn't happen, people wouldn't be like, oh, yeah. And then the price of bread went off. Like, you know, that isn't something that they would talk about if it hadn't happened. But it, you know, that is something that we, we see. So we're like, oh, OK, wow. Great job, Mansa. You know, it's, it's fun. Oh. I like I don't know. I just think he's a G. I'm like, I just really think he's a cool guy. Yeah, because in Chronicles, we say that he was just giving gold to, like, pilgrims along the way. He's like, oh, yeah, you're cool, have some gold. Or, oh, you're cool, um, have some gold and give me something in exchange. But, like, something tiny, he's like, oh, give me a souvenir. Like, anything you have. Oh, uh, yes, have some gold. I'll and, take this rock. Here's a yeah, thousand yeah, gold. absolutely. <laughs> But, like, what yeah. a cool thing to do. Like, what a cool guy, right? Like, it's very, like, Elvis and the Cadillacs, yeah. right? Where it's just kind of like, you know, go around. It's like, I can do this, so I'm doing it, right? And I think that it's it's really interesting, too, because fundamentally, I, I remember once I was, like, you know, being incredibly cool at a pub and talking about this and, uh, with a friend. And they were like, yeah, but, Eleanor, haven't you just, like, fallen for Mansa Musa's propaganda? And I'm like, <gasps> well, quite possibly, but, you know... <laughs> I like it. You know, I'm, a, I'm allowed to realize the two things. Like, one, yeah, it's a form of propaganda, but I can decide that I like that, right? Like, that's that's way better than, I don't know, just commissioning a chronicle about how great you are and not doing any kind of anything for regular people. I, I think, think it's, it's just way cooler. Yeah, it, I think it is, like you say as well. It's because it's got so many unsexy details. Makes it true, mm -hmm. right? Maybe not the 60,000 <laughs> yeah. soldiers, yeah, but that's I mean... He probably had something like 300 camels. That's yeah. not unreasonable at all. But 60,000 mm. soldiers, like that's yeah. more that's, yeah. than, you know, people in the average big city, yeah. maybe. But it's also, and it's like you... six, that's six Parises, 
right? Yeah, no, like, that's yeah. just... <laughs> but Paris is tiny, so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, if you look at it, like all of this is like a form of propaganda, right? Like tournaments, propaganda, pilgrimage, propaganda, like everything you do in this time is like big propaganda. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I will show people how pious I yeah. am. I will show the power of our realm. Yeah. I will... Including uh, tours. <laughs> the other feature of tours and tournaments. <laughs> Essentially, the re- reverse hold court. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that it's important to kind of like, that's one of the things that's so great about this expansion is it shows that, right? Like, and I don't mm. think that, you know, when, you, when you're a big nerd and you spend all of your time thinking about this, it's obvious that these things are kind of like a way of, um, you know, establishing dominance, establishing your reputation, things like this. But, um, you know, most people just be like, oh, yeah. And then uh, people were very holy and then they went to Jerusalem mm. and it's like, yeah, sure. But, you know, there's, there's, there's also some real good things in it for you at the same time. Yeah, I was thinking about like, you know, all these royal entries that they did into cities as well, because uh, that's what we model in tours mostly. I was thinking about mm-hmm. Henry VI when he uh, entered London after, you know, being crowned Queen of France and that big deal. And he's received by three ladies that are, you know, uh, the lady, like the empresses of grace, fortune and nature, if it is. And then 40 maidens with the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit and then a fountain of wine that we still haven't cracked as far as I know, like how it works. And then the genealogy of his whole family, like carved out. And then the genealogy of Christ is like all this whole big thing. Be like, oh, you're so important. I remember yeah, I mean, you going I'm, on about this earlier, but the whole yeah. genealogy of Jesus as well. Oh, that, that was huge. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I, I absolutely love these two, right? Because it's like you, you get these yeah. kind of like, well, it's, it's not practical, but like, you know, everyone everyone loves a wine fountain, right? We all we all love to see a wine fountain. So it's like, like that brings people in. But it also shows you how incredibly astute medieval people are and how they really have a, a very complex understanding of um, things like allegory and representations, because it's like they'll be, they could be like, oh yeah, there you go, there's the there's the graces of the Holy Spirit, mm-hmm. yeah. Oh look, oh it, it, it's the seven liberal arts. You know, people are always people are forever dressing up as the seven liberal arts, stuff like that. So it's interesting because, you know, in the first place, this is how you throw a big party. You're like, yeah, like it, costumes, 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 like you know. But also, the people who are seeing it know enough about all of these cultural things that they can enjoy it and identify those things. So it tells us a lot about um, the level of sophistication that society is actually at at the time when you see what kings are kind of doing in order to flex, right? Yeah, I'm absolutely obsessed with the wine fountain because uh, we made an event uh, to the game, obviously, because this was like such a cool thing to do. And you can choose to have like a wine fountain, but you can also choose to have a juice fountain and then the kids mm-hmm. love you. Like, so all the present kids <laughs> like in the tour are like, you're oh. the best person ever. We love this stuff. Oh, that's yeah. so sweet, literally. Yeah. yeah. I want a juice fountain. Like, I mean, when you think about what juice is at the time, too, where it's like a real juice fountain, I'm like, oh, actually, that's pretty convincing to me. You know, like, if there was a fountain of, like, fresh orange juice, your girl would be there. Absolutely. We uh, spent a lot of time doing different um, approaches for the tour as well. Mm -hmm. So Mm. when you're planning a tour around your realm, um, firstly, you decide why you're doing it in the first place, which could be to pacify Mm -hmm. your vassals. Very common uh, post-succession, especially, you know, you've just ascended Mm. to the throne, you've been coronated, let's go out and show your vassals who you are and who they should pay homage to. Um, Mm. And then we have the intimidation tour, which is more of a maybe little Genghis Khan approach to things, where it's like, hey. Nice. Remember, you yeah. serve me. You put, yeah. uh, there are events where you just charge all the artists under false crimes. You're like, oh yeah, you look um, very sinful to me. And you just put that in a row and just imprison them. It's yeah. real cool. And the, and the last uh, one and my personal favorite uh, would be the taxation tour. Yeah. Um, mm. Where I just looked up how many crazy nonsensical taxes that were levied on everyone. Oh. Um, yeah. I love that. See that, and that is such an interesting one too, because it's like uh, that, in a way, a form of intimidation tour, right? Mm -hmm. Where it's kind of like, oh yeah, the coffers are a bit dry. So hi, look, it's me, the king. Pony up, you know. I I love it because you do. You definitely see uh, them do things like this, you know, where you're kind of like, 
especially like it's a big thing for Holy Roman emperors Mm -hmm. when they kind of take over, they will suddenly kind of show up places sometimes that they haven't shown up before where they're like, Hey, remember how you're Imperial? And everyone's like, Oh man, like you (laughs) haven't come all the way up to like Hamburg in years. And it's like, yeah, but I'm here now. So, and then it it, it always is like very pregnant with meaning, right? Where, you know, the, the emperor doesn't show up for no reason. Right. It's like I mean, what that means can mean a lot of things. It could be like, I'm reminding you of what your tour duties are. I'm, I'm reminding you of the fact that if I decide to go to war, you're going to have to, like, bring something in. Um, I'm reminding you of, you know, the purposes of taxation or I'm just showing up to be like, hey, it's me, the emperor. Right. Yeah. Like, and, that, and that is that is a thing, too. You know, it's a way of going on holiday or uh, acquiring a bunch of relics. If you want to, for example, right? Yeah, we also see examples. Uh, I'm thinking of Northern uh, Iberia, where people absolutely hated when the uh, king came to visit because they were like, oh, he's going to ask for money. We're going to have to <laughs> feed him and his whole entourage. He's going to, you know, make trouble. It's not going to be fun. And people were like, oh, it's the king is coming. And they were like, oh, a gang. <gasps> Yeah, and it's it's a real it's a real kind of worry for a lot of them uh, too, where it's kind of like it's going to empty the coffers because mm-hmm. of what you're going to have to provide in terms of hospitality. But then also you have these interesting examples where sometimes they go too far as well. Like there was a, a case here at a, a castle in Essex where they hosted the king, and um, they were like, "Okay, everybody, we've got new livery livery for all of our uh, footmen. We're like line up." And we're going to greet the king and we're going to show him how much money we're prepared to spend and how fancy we want to do this. And then they get in trouble because it's like, why do you have your own private army for all these men in livery? And, and the king takes it as a threat mm-hmm. instead of kind of like a greeting. So you, you have to really also be careful of how you go with it. Because if you're like, you know what? Yeah, we're about to spend a bunch of cash, but at least this will like show our place in society. You can also mess that one up. That's so cool. That is really cool, actually. I'm not sure if we have anything like that in the game. Uh, no, but we should. We should. <laughs> we should. Like, no, no random threats? Uh, <laughs> uh, no, it's mostly the king threat. Yeah, it's mostly. Yeah, the, the person going on a tour is the one being like, hmm. I mean, it's not entirely yes. true. Things, bad things can happen to you on a tour oh, as yeah. well. Depends if you travel through your rival's lands or you try... Oh, yeah. Mm. If you mm. try to um, even go to someone that dislikes you, they might decide to just block you out of their castle and yeah, not yeah, receive you at all. Yeah, they can just turn you away. They can be like, no, no, not Yeah, here. like it's, that's a, a way of doing, uh, for example, casus belli uh, that, mm-hmm. that happens. So um, here in England, uh, it, it, Isabella the She-Wolf, shout out. Again, one of my favorite regents. <laughs> we, we simply love to see love her. Um, she um, ends up kind of like kicking off like a big conflagration with a lot of uh, nobility where when she's estranged from her husband, she shows up at a castle in Kent where she knows they don't like her. Mm. And it's like, hey, it's me, the queen. I'd like dinner. And they're like, I'm not letting you in, ma'am. And then she's like, how dare you? How dare you? <laughs> and then the, the French send a bunch of troops and it turns into like a big conflagration. So it is also a way of starting military conflicts if you know people don't like you and you kind of like want a way of doing it. Because technically you're always supposed to let the queen in, mm-hmm. right? But, you know, are, are you going to or not? That's the question. It's like, how, like, what's her level of uh, rank? Does she have enough power in order to kind of like force you to do it against your will? Like, what does it all mean? Right. Mm-hmm.